My man, my man, Cortland is in the house. All right, guys, I am excited out of my mind. Uh, oh, wait, let him, he's not connected to audio. There he is. I just want him to be able to hear the amazing things I say about him. Uh, you're on mute, Warren. Uh, I just, I, we got, we've got a great turnout today and I'm sure more people will be on. And as many of you know, we record these calls and, and then people get on the YouTube channel and watch the recordings. Um, and I'm super excited because um, my wife, uh, Casey Council Jiha, who is also on the call today, has uh, known Cortland for 18 years. I have known Cortland for about 15 years. And uh, we recently asked him to join us at an event in San Antonio. And he was our guest speaker for, uh, uh, for I think we had, I don't know, 70 to 100 people in the room. I don't know. And it was just incredible what he delivered. And it was so moving to me. And um, I, I pride myself on being somebody who's constantly, constantly working on becoming a better version of myself, even uh, no matter how old I get or how many experiences I have, I feel like there's room for me to grow. And when, when I listened to Cortland speak, we got to hear him speak two days, uh, Monday morning, and again on Wednesday morning, I realized I still have a lot of growth in me. And it was life changing and life altering. So I asked him if he would be a guest on our call. Uh, he has a very busy schedule. He travels all over the United States and Canada speaking, and he changes lives. Uh, Cortland has let, led an incredible life. And I don't want to do too much of an introduction because part of who he is is part of how he speaks. So uh, I'm going to first say, Cortland Warren, welcome to my free Friday coaching call. Uh, guys, I want to remind all of you. This, this call is company agnostic. We don't care what company you're with. Uh, we don't even care what you do for a living. Uh, we do not do any recruiting or selling on this call. The only thing I do allow is when we have a guest speaker, especially someone like Cortland, if he wants to advertise his wares at the end of the call, we certainly welcome that because I know a lot of people who have, have literally changed the outcome of their lives as a result of being coached by or taught by Cortland. So without further ado, let's get rocking and rolling. Mr. Cortland Warren, uh, meet this uh, amazing group of people from all over the United States and Canada. Well, excellent and excellent. Thank you very much, Rick. And good morning. If you're able to hear me okay, just do like a physical thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All right. That's, uh, that's all we need. That's rock and roll. Rick, I am uh, I'm honored. Uh, Casey, hello. Uh, I see Tracy. I see Selena. So some familiar faces. That always feels good. Uh, but to those of you that I am a stranger to, um, I hope to uh, change that narrative in the short time uh, that we have together. Um, I, I, am, uh, I am grateful because to, to be uh, invited uh, to be a part of a call such as this uh, is not something that I take lightly. Um, this is a network that you have built and continue to build, Rick. And so for me, a, a recommendation or the opportunity, an opportunity such as this is not one that, that I take lightly. And it is my belief that those of you who are tuned in, uh, you're frankly not tuned in uh, to hear me. You're not, uh, you didn't log on to, to hear or even see me as much as uh, there is some part of you that has uh, a hope or a desire for a solution to a problem that you're looking to solve. And if I am a person who enables you to close the gap between knowing and doing, then uh, you're, you're grateful for that. But I in no way believe that you're here to, to either see me, hear me, listen to me, or whatever the case might be. Um, that said, uh, uh, my, my objective over the next 50 minutes or so is to support you in a mindset that enables you to bounce back from things that make other people quit. Uh, to say that differently, uh, we're going to explore resilience and how to raise your resilience quotient. Uh, it has been determined long before me, people uh, much more capable than, than I, uh, determined uh, that the number one predictor, the number one predictor of life success, the, a life of achievement, ultimately what separates uh, the talkers from the doers, what separates the achievers from the non-achievers, those that get it and those who don't. Um, I first had to, to embrace the idea that there is no esoteric being 
that sits high and looks low and is picking and choosing who gets to win and lose uh, or who's determining or predetermining who's going to have a great life, who's going to have an okay life, and uh, who's going to have what we might term a bad life. That's not how it works. I used to think that, but that's not how it works. As it turns out, the number one predictor of achievement versus non-achievement is resilience. It's not IQ. It's not how smart you are. Uh, it's not how many people you know and not how uh, charismatic you are. Uh, ultimately, it's uh, your resilience quotient. And resilience simply measures your ability to bounce back from challenge and adversity. And so uh, that's my objective um, uh, this morning. Uh, it, is, it, is an, it is incredibly humbling for me to have an opportunity such as this because uh, it is just, it, you know what, Rick, for me, it's, just, it's, it's hard to even call it work. You know, I get, I get so excited when I do it. I get amped up. I'm nervous even now. So I got to calm down a little bit. It's a little <laughs> bit different. Like when you're talking to a group of people, you know, that you don't know. And, you know, you, you make up all kinds of stuff. Why they're logged on, why the camera's on, why it's not. You know, who's this guy? Why should I listen to him? Uh, is he believable? You know, what I all know, what I also know is that like judgments or prejudgments have been made. All right. And we're only like two minutes in. You know what I mean? And so it's like. I, I, I calm down. Let me relax a bit because what I know that I know is resilience. I know that I know that. And, uh, and so I got to remember that I'm not on trial because I know that I know resilience. My life is a testament of resilience and bouncing back from challenges and adversity. Uh, not to suggest that my story is any more gruesome or you know, harder than anyone else's, but when you're going through it, it's all relative. Right, to the person that is experiencing it, at the time that they're experiencing it, it's the toughest thing, it's the hardest thing. And so um, as, I, as I take a deep breath, because really what I want is not to impress you, I want, you to, I want someone on this call or someone listening to this to hear something, and as a result of hearing it, you take a specific, intentional, deliberate action that changes the trajectory of your life. So you wanna know my agenda for this morning? It's not to sell you anything other than this belief that somewhere along the way you bought a lie. That somewhere along the way you bought hook, line, and sinker, you bought a lie that said that you're not ready yet. You bought a lie that said you're not good enough, not deserving, not worthy, you need another certification, some more letters behind your name, whatever it is. And I am in the business of busting those types of things up. Uh, a little bit, you know, uh, my background, um, 20 years or so in the personal development uh, seminar industry. Uh, I've been in front of about, um, you know, rough estimate, though verifiable, uh, 48,000 or so live uh, human beings in, in person. Uh, that's a lot of people in my book. Uh, the town I grew up in has 7,000 people in it. And uh, Ida Bell, Oklahoma, I often talk about Ida Bell just because uh, it speaks to what resilience can do for a person. But uh, Ida Bell, Oklahoma is home, uh, uh, 7,000 people. Uh, there were more people, you know, on the college campus that I went to that, that li than live in the town where I grew up. Uh, Facty.com, they, they did a study. I shared this with the group there at Build. <laughs> They did a study and they ranked the worst places to live. You can go to it. Facty, don't go to it right now because I'm talking, that'd be rude. But you go to facty.com, facty.com, and they rated the worst places to live in America. And uh, Ida Bell, Oklahoma was ranked number 10. Number 10. Can you believe that? I mean, you know, the Philadelphias and the San Francisco's and the New York's, the Bronx and all. Ida Bell, Oklahoma was ranked number 10, and it rates things like, you know, uh, you know living with, uh, with beneath the, uh, the poverty line, crime per capita, so forth. Someone asked me one time, my goodness, what do you guys do there? And I said, everything, everything. And, uh, you know, we're, it's a very black and white town, okay? Black and white meaning culturally, uh, eth ethnically. Uh, if you did a Google Maps or a Google Earth and you kind of zoomed in on Ida Bell, Oklahoma, you would see these railroad tracks that divide the city east and west. And growing up, for me, it felt as though all of the good things that were happening were on the opposite side of town, all right? So uh, it, it, it was like there were the haves and the have-nots. And we were on the have-not side of town or in the have-not line. Uh, everything good or positive was on the opposite side. 
So like, uh, you know, you got to remember, I'm a kid growing up. So to me, McDonald's was good. OK, uh, but it was on the opposite side of town. School was on the opposite side of town. Uh, the post office was on the opposite side of town when my mom had to pay bills or go get groceries. All of those things happened on the opposite side of town. And uh, so growing up, you know, my question really early became, why is it that some have and others don't? Does that make sense? Or anyone ever, anyone ever ask that question? Like you look into your business and you say, well, why is it that some are excelling in this market? Some are excelling in this economy and others are getting out. Like, how come? And typically what happens is we look for the justification as to why. Well, they have the right, you know, area code with their phone. They live in the right, uh, they, right they live in the right, you know, area. They live in the right neighborhood. They know the right people. And so what happens is when we're looking to justify why it is that some do and others do not, the first place we stop is the justifications. Okay, we start with justifications. And so I was that. I, you know, I, I had my justifications as to why. Uh, and, and so, but what I really wanted to do beyond the justifications, when justifications don't work, then we can move into uh, shame, right? We shame ourselves. We become very self-critical. We get hard on ourselves, down on ourselves. And then evo eventually we get to a place where, you know what? I'm tired of shaming myself. And then we can move into blame, blaming other people. Okay, it's, it's their fault. They're, uh, they're the reason, the system, the man, uh, wh whatever the case may be, my parents and so forth. So let me ask you, of those three, blame, shame, and justification, which of those three is going to support you in growing your business? Type of, uh, which are, uh, so we'll call blame number one, shame number two, and justification number three. Which of those, one, two, or three, you can just type that in the chat, which of those three is going to support you in growing your business? Blame, shame, or justification? Oh, man, we got a smart group. They, they didn't fall for it, Rick. I got a whole lot of... Uh, a whole lot of nuns. Okay, blame, shame, justification will support you in growing your business. Blame, shame. neither of those is going to support you in growing your business. So why spend any time there? One of the early lessons that I learned from a mentor, his name was uh, Marshall Thurber. Uh, he, he simply said, Cortland, what I want you to do first and foremost is stay above the line. So below the line, we call it, we call it shame, 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 shame. We call it uh, blame, shame, and justification. So what happens is if, you know, I look for other people to blame, they're the reason why or why not this thing or that thing did or did not happen. I get done with blame, I can move into shame. I become critical, hard on myself. Anyone here notice that you, if we had a listening device, if we could listen in to the, conver the internal uh, conversations that you have, how many of you would be in a relationship with someone who spoke to you the way you speak to yourself? I oftentimes ask that question of people. I say, would you be in a relationship would you marry a person who spoke to you the way you speak to yourself all right a lot of people a lot of people in my years of experience answer that question no all right so blame doesn't work shame doesn't work and then justification right none of those three is really going to grow your business and so marshall said Cortland, what i want you to do is just like draw if you were if you wrote those things like uh let's say vertically then just draw a line above justification and then above justification, I want you to write in the word responsible. And I'm like, all right, respond. Now, my first, uh, at, at first, I had a reaction to the word responsible because I heard responsible as meaning it's my fault. Uh, it, you know, I'm the reason that it happened. Uh, I'm, I'm to blame. So I still went to self-criticism. And then Marshall enabled me to have a different uh, understanding of the word. In his context, he said, no, responsible just means that no matter where I've been, or no matter what I've been through, then what comes next is up to me. I know I'm speaking kind of fast because I've got a lot to cover, but you just consider that, all right? So again, no matter where I've been and no matter what I've been through, what comes next is up to me. That's how he viewed responsible. What comes next is up to me. Now, that, uh, that idea is definitely more empowering it's uh, it was it was uh, it, it is a different way of viewing the world. It doesn't remove the fact that there are things that you dealt with. It doesn't mean that you haven't had to go through some very, you know, some in some cases, horrendous and even traumatic events and experiences. But it takes the power away from the experience or the event. And declares that I have the power to dictate what comes next. 
Someone asked me one time, well, Cortland, you know, uh, you make promises that, you know, three days can change a person's life. And they questioned that. And I said, well, what do you mean? No, three th I said, you can have a moment in time that changes your life. Yes or no? Yes. A sudden phone call, a diagnosis, a letter in the mail, getting laid off a job, a moment in time can change a person's life. So why couldn't three days change a person's life? Your life has been changed moment by moment by moment. And what is extraordinarily powerful is the understanding that you in any moment can decide or determine that your life is going to be different going forward. Now, even in making that determination, what you got to know is in making that determination, it does not remove that there will be challenges and obstacles that come up. And so that's why we uh, that's why I suggest that we start with resilience. OK, we're going to start with resilience. I'm the person, you know, I, I've oftentimes been called like an alchemist. You know, I, I transform people's beliefs. I, I, I have people reshape, reframe their life experiences, those that uh, uh, altered their belief structure. And I support them in having beliefs that align with what they say they want. I believe that's the starting place. There are a lot of how to's out there. And I'm certain that if I tune into this call, uh, week in and week out, there would be times when I would hear the how to's, particularly as it relates to real estate and attraction and building and so forth. Um, I consider myself to be the person before the system. Okay, I'm the belief before the system. Because if you're a leader on this call, then it's likely that you have, uh, that you've led teams, you lead teams, you know groups of people, that you have an extraordinary system. You have a system that works. And yet, even with the best system, if a person's belief don't align, if their beliefs don't align, then they won't do the work that the system outlines. Does that make sense? All right. So you can have the best system and all of the proof and evidence that it works. But if your beliefs don't match, then you won't do it. And the reason for that is because we will never act consistently in any way that is inconsistent with your self-image. You will never act consistently in any way that is inconsistent with your self-image. You will not do it. You will be a flash in the pan. There will be some times when the, res the results are extraordinary. You'll, you'll, you'll see flashes of greatness, but it being consistent will not happen until or unless you've done the work to ensure that it aligns with your self-image. So what we're going to be exploring here then is how do you do that as it relates to resilience? Um, my, my style, I'll just say up front, uh, my style is not a style that, that fits everybody. Okay. And I had to, you know, I had to surrender to that, uh, Rick. I had, to, I had to surrender to as much as I want everyone to get it. Um, I'm not for everyone. Okay. So I, I say up front uh, what the material that I'm going to, to share with you is not for you. It is not for you if you're looking for ways to be comfortable with being less than you're capable of. It's not for you. Um, my, my approach is not for you if you resent the success that other people have worked and earned. If there's a part of you that would rather stay in envy and jealousy because of what someone else has paid the price to create, then what I have and, and the research that I have done doesn't fit you. You're not, I'm not saying you're wrong for it. I just don't have anything that meets that, uh, that psyche or th that, mental, uh, that mental approach. Uh, it's not for you if you're looking for uh, a scapegoat or a way out of doing the work necessary to transform your beliefs. And what I know to be true is that transformation requires that a price be paid. So whether that's the lump of coal becoming a diamond, that doesn't happen without the pressure without the pressure that earth, uh, that earth applies, okay? So uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a all you gotta do is kind of person. Um, I, I, I believe that if you're honest with people about what's required, then they'll make the decision that fits them right now. But, but what I know to be true is that it does require a level of work and that's what separates. Uh, it is for you if you know or believe that you have more to give. If there's a part of you that believes you can do more, be more, and have more, then this is for you. 
if you if there's a part of you that believes that uh, uh, you have a say in how your life unfolds, then you'll want to listen in. And if you're ready now, not some day, and you recognize that no one else can give you permission to be great, then you'll find value in what I'm going to share. Fair enough? So the, the, the conversation around resilience is a conversation that uh, it ultimately begins and ends with understanding what you are made of. Now, this is, this is kind of basic, but we'll build from it uh, because I know that the masters never ignore the fundamentals. So this might be, you know, like kind of third grade level, okay, um, but, but we're going someplace. And what I also know is that the masters, they never take, it, they, they never take for granted the fundamentals. Uh, the, the, the novice does, uh, but, you know, they, they get bored in the fundamentals. The masters are always doing the things that are basic, okay? So an understanding of, uh, of resilience is one in which you understand what you're made of. Okay, it's what you're made of that gives you the power and energy to bounce back or to be resilient. If I had a if I had a if I had a drinking glass and I have a basketball and I'm standing on a, you know, let's say four story building and I drop the drinking glass on concrete, I drop the basketball onto concrete, the basketball bounces and it'll likely bounce pretty high. The glass shatters. How come? Obviously, right? Obviously, well, it's because, you know, someone will say, well, one's a drinking glass, the other's a basketball. That's why. But if we go deeper into that, it's say, well, what we know, it is, because, it is because of the materials. Catch this. It is because of the materials with which it is made. The drinking glass is tempered at 1700 degrees, 1700 degrees to even become glass itself, 17, heated to 1700 degrees. It's highly stressed, even as you drink out of it. The basketball is made of materials that are elastic. So when I drop the basketball, its materials allow it to bounce back. The drinking glass is made of materials that cannot withstand that resistance and so that glass shatters. It's what it's made of that allows it to bounce back. Now let's translate to human beings. What are you made of? What, beyond the physical you know, organs and so forth, what are you made of? Uh, in the live event, I'll ask groups of people, I say, well, you know, bring, you know, bring to mind a small child and the qualities of a small child. And often we'll hear things like, well, children are, uh, they're trusting and they're honest and they're persistent and they're curious and they're excited and they're loving and they're, you know, they, they get upset. They have, they experience all of the emotions and they're right. And then I'll ask the question. I said, well, now those qualities and characteristics are those qualities and characteristics inherent in some small children or are they in all small children? Is it that only certain children who come into the world are trusting, honest, persistent, and brave? Or is it that some small children are honest and trusting, persistent, and brave? And to a person, individuals will say, well, no, uh, it's all small children. We come into the world with that capacity. I'll say, well, you know, children are loving. Now, some, every now and then, someone will, make, will, will, like, will look to make the argument, well, no, 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 not, but it, 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 that's not true because some kids are da, da, da. But what they're missing is, the question is, when you come into the world, not at two, three, four years old, for some, damage has already been done based on life experience and upbringing, but coming into the world, they're trusting. No, notice this, no one teaches a small child how to be honest. You know, if anything, as adults, we'll, we'll teach them how to lie. And the lie might start out with something as simple as, you know, the, shh, don't tell your dad about this, right? You get the idea, okay? But coming into the world, those qualities and characteristics are in place. Now, so then what happens to the small child? Well, they grow up, right? Life happens or life experiences happen. For example, how many of you would say, or you know, you don't just say like, you know that you have trust issues. Physically, like raise your hand if you have if you have trust issues. It's all good. You tr you trust issues. Okay, right on. All right. Now, for example, if you didn't just raise your hand 
because you thought that by raising your hand, you're going to be signing up for something. Like that would be an example of a trust issue. Get the idea? All right. So <laughs> I love it. People are like, I don't, I don't have no trust issues at all. You're not going to get me. You're not going to get me. I don't have any trust issues at all. You're not going to get me. <laughs> it's hilarious. All right. So, um, but so then, so what happens? So you didn't come into the world distrustful. Okay. You didn't, you know, if you look into your personal relationships uh, and if you know in your personal relationships that you tend to hold things back, like you reserve love. If you've said, well, you're not, you don't give everything that you have to give. And I, if I ask you, well, how come? Well, if I do that, right, then I got nothing left. What if it's rejected? So forth and so on. And I make the case that you did not come into the world that way. You, 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 you in your business, when you, you know, if in your business, the persistence, if persistence is lacking, if commitment is lacking, understand that you did not come into the world that way. There's no reasonable room for debate on it. And I don't like to go into hypotheticals because I don't have the time. There's no reasonable room for debate. You did not come into the world afraid of winning. You did not come into the world settling for less. You did not come into the world uh, uh, justifying to yourself why it was okay to go at less than 100%. That is not how you came into the world, and you will not convince me otherwise. So what happened? Life happened, or life experiences happened. And from our life experiences, we develop programs. We develop these other ways of thinking or belief structures. And I know if you've spent any amount of time with Rick and Casey, you've heard of this idea of programming and conditioning. So what happens is life happens or life experiences happen. And from those life experiences, we develop a new belief or belief structure. That's how we develop a self-image. And what happens then is we move out into our lives and we will attract into our lives uh, evidence of whatever will support the belief that we have in place. Now, I just said a mouthful, but it doesn't make sense to go any further unless I know that you got that part, okay? So you come into the world with these qualities and characteristics. Life happens or life experiences happen. And from those life experiences, we develop new beliefs. Then what happens is you will go out into your life and you will attract into your life events and experiences that provide you with evidence of whatever you've determined or chosen to believe. Okay, now I want to pause for just a second and um, uh, uh, want to, you know, so what's, what's resonating with you, what's not resonating? Me just, me just talking for an hour really doesn't do a whole lot of good, okay? So uh, anyone want to recap what I've said so far, what you're following so far, or have a question about anything I've shared so far? Going once, going twice, you just, you just in, uh, you're in, in just in love with my voice. Hand. Okay, go for it. What do you we got? Oh, wait, Michelle has her hand up. Uh-huh, go for it. Um, what just totally resonated with me was not coming into the world, but things happening in life that develop your beliefs. That was like, I could cry right now. <laughs> right on. That was huge. Is is it what what is a if I and I and I know you volunteer and, and thank you for not That's leaving me hanging, Michelle. Thank you for not leaving me hanging. I appreciate that. Some people just just stared at me, you know. Yes, I get dressed up for my zooms. You probably even saw a second ago I did a <laughs> breath spray. As the, look, as though you can smell it. I, I put on cologne and everything. Okay. But it's out of respect for my audience. But that's it. Okay. So what's a so when you think so if you so what's a belief, Michelle, that you have like you would like to get rid of, like one that holds you back in, in building your business or, uh, you know, just growing your life or relationships, uh, personal or professional? Um, professional that uh -huh. I, uh, that I'll never be successful, that I will never, I will never be serving my full purpose. Okay. Okay. That. that that's, that's perfect. That's right? that's, per that's perfect. Per that's, I mean, now, it's not perfect that you believe that. OK, but that's <laughs> that's that's an example of what we're talking about. OK, now what is so that belief? So what is it about Michelle? OK, what is it about Michelle that Michelle 
will never realize her full potential, but someone else will. What what is it about Michelle that that is like what you know that will keep Michelle from ever realizing her fullest potential? Hmm. Um. Gosh, that's a good question. Like that's why I ask it. Now, getting, stay, stay, stay. getting out of my getting out of my own way. Like right, right. Like that, that's what you're gonna need to do. That's what you're gonna need to do. But let's go back a little bit, okay? Let's go back a little bit to like what will like what's the like what is the belief that you have about you? And, and, and with with respect, if we could just stay out of the chat right now, because I don't want to answer for Michelle. We got, uh, okay, so uh, uh, what's the belief that you have about you? Okay, that promotes. The, or that supports this belief that I was never good enough. Okay. All right. So now, now would you, so when you came into the world, okay, imagine, you know, uh, you know, what, what's your birthday? Uh, you don't have to give me the year, but what's the, the day? March 3rd. Okay. March 3rd, uh, 2003. Okay. March 3rd, March 1968. Okay. No. March 3rd, March 3rd, 1968. Okay. So March 3rd, 1968, Michelle comes into the world and all I'm all I'm getting at so far in the presentation, OK, is that on March 3rd, 1968, when Michelle came into the world, Michelle did not come into the world with the belief that I'm not good enough. Fair enough. Yes, that's all. That's that's all we're establishing up to this point. I will make the case that you came into the world with the capacity to be resilient and focused and disciplined and courageous and taking risks and loving and trusting. Like that's what you came into the world with March 3rd. Okay. Yes. We look at, we fast forward to today and Michelle is like, I mean, yeah, I see the system. I see the program before I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to, it's not going to work. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to experience the success I can. And I'm just, you know, I, I I'm just, I'm just not. Okay. All I'm, what we've established so far is that that belief has occurred as a result of your interpretation of, and I'm sorry, my eyes, it may not look like I'm, I'm where you are on my screen. So no, I, it's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> <I see you. laughs> uh, it's, it's your interpretation of an event or experience. Okay. Yes. It'd be your interpretation of an event. And if we, if we had the time, Okay, over however long it would take, frankly, we would identify what was that event, what was the experience where I, whereby you took on that belief. And then, and the only reason why we say, well, let's go, let's go revisit that because you took that belief on is because we would need that, Michelle, in order for you to see that in your life, what you are attracting into your life is evidence of that belief being true. And you see the world, you're, you're wearing glasses, yes, but you see the world through your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And based on whatever the color, you know, for lack of a better analogy, whatever the color of lenses you have on will shade or that will represent the color of the world that you see. So when I saw the world as I'm not enough and I saw the world as I'm in the have not line, then in my life, I could look around and I saw all of the evidence. So this, you know, really hypey motivational speaker comes into my life on a Friday morning and says, you can do it. You can do it. Just get off your butt and go do it. Just, ah, you didn't go do it. Then you're just not serious about your dreams. And I'm like, screw you. I am serious about my dreams. But look, I got this and this and this and this. And I could point to, and you could as well, point to all the places in your life where it has been evidence that you're not enough and won't be. Fair enough? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's uh, in 35, 36 minutes, <laughs> we've established point number one. <laughs> I gotta go real fast to get to the next two or three. Okay, so point number one, okay, is that it's in you to be resilient because of what you came into the world with. But then what happens to the small child? Well, life happens or life. And thank you very much, Michelle. Life happens or life experiences happen. Thank you. You're welcome. And from our life experiences, we take on new beliefs. Well, because of how powerful we are, then we attract and notice that word because of how powerful we are, because of how powerful you are, Michelle, 
because of how powerful you are. Because of how powerful you are. You attract into your life the evidence so that you can be right about your beliefs. The evidence that we have of that is how energy works. And I, I definitely don't have time to go into that uh, this morning, but suffice to say, and, I, and you'll all agree, right, that the thought is the beginning of all creation. So the, the computer that I'm using for the Zoom, this microphone, uh, my pocket square, uh, the cell phone, uh, the ink pen, right? It all starts as an idea in someone's mind. Again, basic, but, but, but the pros never ignore the fundamentals, ever, okay? Right? Uh, the, the, you know, the novice wants it to be said new and different. The pro knows that it's the, all the truth is in the basics. So, right, this ink pen, right, was first an idea in someone's mind. It didn't just appear out of nothingness. Someone had the idea for it, and then there's the physical manifestation of it. Okay? Now, we can understand that for physical objects like this ink pen, but what if that was the same for the results that you're seeing or not seeing in your business? What if you saw your business and the results in your business as a manifestation of thoughts? Just like this pen was first an idea in someone's mind, the results that you're seeing in your business are evidence of what you have been thinking. How many of you, if you could find that that were true, then you'd be ready to do some work to change your thinking? <laughs> it's like, well, hold on a second. If, if what I'm seeing in my business is a product of what I've been thinking, then where do I go to change my thinking? Or, or how do I make sure to keep thinking this way because I want my business to keep flourishing the way that it is? I don't know if there's anything worse than succeeding than succeeding and not knowing how you did it. Because if you succeed and you don't know how you did it, then now you're afraid to actually celebrate. You're afraid to actually acknowledge. It's still not good enough, even though you're winning, because you don't know how you did it. Now you're afraid of not being able to recreate it. So now you just go, 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 because you're afraid. So it's actually now you're producing out of fear because you don't know how you did it. That's why, you, well, anyway, I'm sorry, Rick. I kind of went off on a tangent there. Uh, let, me, let me get back. Let me get back. Let me get back. Okay, so. Uh, apologies, amazing. Um, it, it, anything. Back and then we'll talk about the questions later, okay? Okay, all right, okay, perfect, perfect. All right, so uh, uh, <laughs> Rick knows I get all amped up, and I was like, I just start going. All right, I want to give you everything, and yet I have a time constraint. All right, so uh, everything starts with thought, okay? Everything starts with thought. Your business is a manifestation of or actualization of your predominant ways of thinking about you in business. Right. So the first law is law of energy. The second law is the law of perpetual transmutation of energy, which means uh, thoughts become things. So what's happening then is you are now out in your life gathering evidence that supports what you believe about yourself, what you believe about other people, and what you believe about the world. So you are now attracting into your life. Imagine this. Uh, anybody ever uh, have a failed relationship? Any, anybody? One or two? Okay, I'm only talking to you three people right now, okay, who's had a failed relationship before, okay? What if you came to know that every person that you've ever been in relationship with did their job. <gasps> what? Every person that you've ever been in relationship with, they did their job. We attract into our lives people who will support or assist us in being right about what we believe. So if you attract into your life a person who prove themselves to be, to abandon you or to be untrustworthy or to whatever, just know that they came into your life and they did their job, their job being to 
support you in a belief that was already there. They did not come into your life and insert or instill the belief. They came into your life through a frequency of vibration that now draws them to you. You're drawn to them. And it's only to support you in whatever your belief is. So you could genuinely reach out to any person that you've ever been in relationship with and say thank you to them. Why? Because they did their job. You get to be right about whatever you believed. All right, that was bonus, that was free. Okay, so as it relates to your business, okay, as it relates to your business, so I'll come back to Michelle. So, okay, now I'm, okay, I, I recognize I came into the world, I came into the world with this in place, with this, you know, I, I'm equipped to be resilient, but now I show up and uh, it's not, you know, 1968, it's, two, it's 2023, and I don't believe that I'm good enough. Well, what the hell? Well, the, the truth is then that to the extent that you have an event that takes you out of or that that takes you yeah that takes you out of the truth of who you are so if we can establish that you were once you know uh resilient and loving and trusting and all those qualities and characteristics and you fast forward to your life today and you're not those things then there was an event or an experience that you have an emotional connection to and that emotional connection to that event or experience was a traumatic event and to the extent that it removed you or took you out of the truth of who you are, then for you, it is in essence still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. P PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder is not just reserved for military personnel. It is not only reserved for those who valiantly you know, protect the country. Any event, that removes you from the truth of who you are was for you a traumatic event at four years old when my dad left home that was a traumatic event for me whatever the event or uh experience was for you that removed you or took you out of the truth of who you are it was traumatic and until you return to that truth of who you are then you're continuing to suffer from from post-traumatic stress so the loss of a job could be a traumatic event. Uh, loss of a relationship, uh, loss of a loved one, um, a divorce, a diagnosis, all of those are examples of things that can be traumatic for a person. When, that inver when the adversity and challenge hits, okay, it's responded to differently for different people. Some people, they get knocked down. They, uh, I saw in the chat earlier, they get gut punched. And it's like, man, they get knocked down and they... They find a way to bounce back. They at least get back to where they were. Some people have events and experiences that happen, uh, that occur, that they live, uh, or, yeah, that they live through. It knocks them down, and they never get back up. They never return to their former selves. That's post-traumatic stress disorder. So some, when adversity hits, they get knocked down. They find a way to get back to where they were. They kind of sh shake it off. They get back to where they were. Some get knocked down, and they never get back to where they were. And then there are those who, when adversity strikes, they get knocked down. They don't just bounce back to where they were. They go further than they've ever been before. That is referred to as post-traumatic growth. Many people have heard of PTSD. Not as many people have heard of PTG or post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth are those individuals who back was against the wall, the rubber met the road, and they had to come out fighting. They were fighting for their life, their family's life, for their children, for, what, for their cause, for their community, for whatever it was. And you've known, it's likely that you've experienced it. You've had those moments. You know a person who is experiencing post-traumatic growth when they say things like, man, the best thing that ever happened to me was losing my job because I had to make it work. I had to start my own business. Or the, I mean, the best thing that ever happened was losing that relationship because I, you know, it didn't feel like it at the time. But now that I look, I had to make space. I had to make room for the love of my life or what I really desire to create. Is this making sense? If so, give me, uh, just raise your hands and make, make it sense. That's what I mean by post-traumatic growth. What is, uh, what is fairly unknown 
is that post-traumatic growth can actually be taught. Post-traumatic growth is a skill that can actually be taught. And it's not just reserved for a few people. Okay, so I'm going to give you this tool. And then if Rick is so kind, he'll invite me back for a part two and we can uh, pick up from here. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. So this is what I got in the time that we got left. All right. So wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you serious? You'll come back for another one? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I love, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the next, yeah. The next absolutely. call is the first Friday. If you can make time, the first, we go first and third Fridays. Oh, first the third first Friday. Friday, I believe of the month is, does anyone know, is it the fourth of August? Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. I'm going to tell yeah. you. Yeah, we can do that. Oh my I'm God. Are you guys excited or is it just me? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm about to pee my pants right now. So Corbin, <laughs> thank you very much. Keep going. Well, thank you. I, I want to get it in. I just like, oh, okay. All right. So, oh, so post-traumatic growth. Okay. It's a real thing. It's not just some slick language that a motivational speaker came up with. It's actually now being taught to military personnel. OK, because what they started to recognize is that our military, uh, you know, uh, personnel were returning home and they didn't return to their former cells. And yet some did. OK, so as it turns out, OK, uh, uh, as it turns out, post-traumatic growth is a skill that can be taught. And then uh, we can pick up. Well, shoot uh, on the first well, I'll, I'll have more stuff. Better. All right. So uh, PTG. Okay, post-traumatic growth. Uh, the author's uh, Martin Seligman. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, his reading is pretty dense. His reading, but if you're into that, you know you can go read it. Uh, he did a lot of uh, a lot of the research uh, in this area. But you being more resilient, you being more resilient comes down to uh, three P's. Okay, three P's. Uh, the first P is personal. Okay, personal. So what the research shows is that the highly resilient people, okay, highly resilient people take things less personal than those who are not resilient. Okay. So... If we look at your resilience quotient on a, on a scale from zero to 100, 100 being very high, zero being no bounce back to you at all, okay, the closer to 100 you are, then the less personal you take things. Whereas people who are not resilient tend to take things very personally. So when things don't work out, they immediately start to back to that place of blame. OK, well, this always happens to me. You know, I can never get a break. See, I knew not to get excited. I'm going to always be in this place of disappointment. Get the idea. All right. They, they, everything is personal. So the entire economy shifted right when they got into real estate. OK, because you get the idea. All right. So they look at it like, man, see, as soon as I got into real estate, the entire market shifted. It always happens to me like that. They take, they, they really have this viewpoint that the entire economy shifted just so that they couldn't be successful, personal. Whereas the, 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 those who are highly resilient, right, they don't take things personal at all. They recognize that adversity visits everybody. They recognize that everybody goes through it. And it's not some karmic debt that needs to be paid. They are detached from the adversity itself from a personal standpoint. And as a result of that, they're able to move through it more quickly. The second P, just so I can be, uh, honor your time, is, excuse my spelling if I get, didn't get it right. Okay, I put it in the chat. Permanence. Okay, permanence. So highly resilient people. Again, if we look at this scale, zero to 100. The closer to 100 you are, meaning you're really resilient and you quickly bounce back, okay? So the more resilient you are, the less time you see the adversity staying around. Whereas those who are not resilient, okay, uh, they see uh, a very long time horizon that, you know, it, it's going to always be, they, they use words like, 
you know, always. It's, it's never going to be different. It's always going to be difficult. Uh, this always happens to me, all right? So permanence relates to the time component. Uh, whereas the highly resilient person sees things that it's just a bump in the road. It's just a bump in the road. I was listening to uh, uh, growing up the Chicago Bulls, my favorite basketball team, and I was a Michael Jordan fan, yes. And so I was watching the documentary of uh, The Last Dance, and it, uh, it, it highlights that series, that final series against the Utah Jazz. Uh, knowing some, um, some things about resilience, I'm listening to Michael Jordan in the press conference after they were down, I believe, 2-1. And he says, so a reporter asked him, say, so Mike, you guys are down in the series. You know, uh, what's, you know what, what's wrong? What's and he, without even bad an eye, he said, well, <laughs> they still got to come back to Chicago. All right, this, we'll see what they got when they come to Chicago. This here, this is just a bump in the road. Verbatim, it's just a bump in the road. They see it as not something that's going to last forever, but it's required to go through it right now. What if that was your attitude about your business? Whenever challenge came up, what if you just saw it as something that's temporary? We're going to move through it as quickly as we can, but we don't take on the association of it being something that's going to last forever. Okay. So uh, the first P is personal. If you're going to bounce back quickly, don't take things personally. Okay. If you're going to be more resilient, then when it comes to the time component, right? When it comes to the time component, thank you for that, Debbie. Uh, when it comes to the time component, permanence, see it as a bump in the road, not something that's going to last forever, okay? Adversity is a visitor. Don't make it a roommate. Got the idea? Okay. And it visits everybody. Some people allow it to move in because they ruminate on it all day. Uh, just real quick, an example of this would be, let's say a person is, uh, well, you know, I'll, 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 I'll come back to that example in just a moment. I want you to get this third P. The third P is pervasive. Uh, pervasive. Okay, PTG is what? Awesome. Yeah, uh, Sherry, I just see this is why I have to stay out of the chat. But Sherry, I want to acknowledge you. She says uh, PTG is what uh, is what I'm ready and noticing happening since my mother's death. I was scratching my head because the family dynamic was crushing me and now has freed me from the chains. I didn't expect this. Great job. OK, now let me close the chat so I can stay focused. All right. Uh, personal, permanent and pervasive. All right. So pervasiveness really speaks to, uh, you know, uh, not allowing the adversity or the challenge to spread to other areas. It's uh, cancerous, so to speak, okay? Some people, when adversity and challenge comes, uh, they don't keep it localized. They allow a bad day in the office to affect how they are at home. Does that make sense? Whereas highly resilient, closer to 100, they localize things. They don't allow it to spread to other areas, all right? One deal going bad doesn't now affect whether or not your children get to enjoy you this weekend at the park like you promised. They don't allow it to affect every other area or every single thing, okay? It's like a person has a flat tire on Monday morning as they're going out to an, a, listing, a listing appointment, right? They, they, they're going out to a listing appointment on Monday morning. They were off the ready to have a great week. They have a flat tire. And as they're changing that tire, their entire week changed. It's like, damn it. I was so excited and ready for a great week. And now it's ruined. It is ruined. Right? It's like, um, no, it's not. It's Monday morning. You had a flat tire. How in the hell does that affect what's going to be happening on Friday? Well, it does because thoughts become things. Okay. How we're, uh, but that said, what if you started to see that it's not that you had a bad week. You had an inconvenient 15 minutes that you stayed on for an entire week. And that made the difference. You with me? So highly resilient people keep it local. They don't allow it to spread to other areas, all right? Whereas those who lack the resilience can have an, uh, an incident or a challenge in one area, it spreads to all the other areas. And so now a bad day at work becomes, you know, bad for the family, so forth and so on, okay? So the three Ps, if you wanna bounce back quickly, okay? So I can, be, uh, uh, so I can honor what was on the flyer, you know, resilience. 
if you're going to be more resilient, it's a couple of things. One, be reminded of what you're made of and how you came into the world. You're made of the stuff that will allow you to bounce back. It is in you to be great. Number two, life happens or life experiences happen. And from those life experiences, we form or shape our belief structure. And because of how powerful you are, you attract into your life the evidence necessary to be right about what you believe. So sometimes you recognize then that you're creating a world that is not what you intend. Well, we have to do the work of transforming the belief. And uh, if I'll, I'll make a note to myself to cover that, like how we begin to transform the belief, and we'll do that the first Friday in August. Fair enough. But, but for the time being, between now and next uh, two Fridays, from, between now and the first Friday okay, of August, what I want you to do is practice the three Ps. Don't take things personal. Don't see it as permanent. And don't allow it to spread or be pervasive. If you'll do that, you'll see yourself bouncing back quicker than you have been and likely quicker than most. Fair enough? All right. In the minute that I have uh, left, Rick, I'll turn it back over to you. Hey, first and foremost, Cortland, and if I could use the F word, I would. It's so effing good. So good. Uh, number two, guys. There was more people on this call. Remember, hundreds of people watch the recording, but I love it when there's more live people. You need to invite your friends, your family, people from any walk of life for, for the call on the first Friday in August. We will send out this recording as we usually do. It'll get onto the YouTube channel, okay? And you can spread, send it to your friends. Say, watch this and now come and get on week two with me. Uh, number two, uh, Cortland, uh, there was a couple people with questions, but I know that the answers to the questions would take us deep into several minutes. So I'm going to remember the questions. One was from Kerry Sanger, who is a broker. He's a broker in Denver. And um, it was it was a really good question. I'm trying to find it. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, Gosh, I really, oh, Cortland, are there techniques that are effective for changing undesirable subconscious beliefs? And I believe that's what you're working on right now. Would you agree in this PPP and things like that, right? That's correct. Uh, the uh, the three Ps and then yeah. uh, uh, you said it's Terry or Carrie? Carrie, yeah, C -A -R -R -I -N. And, and, and so my promise to you, Carrie, is that I'll come back in week two with more how-tos and uh so, but the, the three P's is, is one way to do it, but I'll come back with some more uh, specific okay. intangible how to's. And then Tammy, one of my faves up here uh, on the screen had a quick question. Tammy, do you want to shoot that out real quick? Can I say it or you want me to put it in the chat? You say no, no. it now. Yeah. Right okay. Here. All right. Um, I love the, um, when you mentioned people, it was at the very beginning because it was taking explicit notes. Um, but you said, you know, people, which would be in reference to us agents, get bored with the fundamentals. And mm. I think that that's so true and where so many um, agents get stuck. Why do you think that um, agents or people with any business mm. um, feel that the fundamentals are, are boring or they're just not, you know, sometimes it could be a confidence issue or, or an ego. They don't think they need to. What is your uh -huh. opinion on that? Because I thought that was very powerful. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, it, it, it is my view, Tammy. And again, it's just, not, it's just my view. I'm not, I'm not the guru. I don't, I don't know it all. Uh, I just act like I do sometimes, but I don't. That's okay. Right? I like the, it. The, the, the truth is more people don't win because they can't do a simple thing for a long enough period of time. Nice. And so a lot of, but that's, but that's actually driven by that's say driven that by. Just yeah, that was that. good. Say that again, slowly. That is huge. I so want good. more people to hear that again. More people don't succeed because they can't do a simple thing for a long enough period of time. Okay. Nice. So what happened now, even that, even that is rooted in a limiting belief. Okay. So how many of you know that you have a tendency to make things harder than they have to be? You tend to make things hard, okay? 
Well, notice that when, if, when you make it hard and then you achieve it, it's like I deserve it or I'm worthy of it more because it was harder for me to get. So subconsciously, we will make things more difficult so that we feel more deserving of it. But in reality, the simple thing, it's kind of like compound interest or paying yourself 10%, right? Uh, it is the simple thing that it, where, whereas many people are out looking for it to be said new and different and, you know, a more, you know, like engaging new way, shiny object, the shiny object. Correct. Right. But in reality, it's the, it, the, the pros. Okay. The difference between a pro and an amateur is a pro never gets away from the fundamentals. Okay. It's, it's back to the old Bruce Lee adage. If you've heard this, where Bruce Lee said, I do not fear the person. I don't fear the man who can, uh, who has 10,000 kicks. I fear the man who has done one kick 10,000 times. Times, yeah. Right? Nice. So because if we can allow ourselves to continually engage in the fundamentals, which are boring, then over time we win. Love it. Thank you so much. That was powerful. Love it. Very welcome. Thank you all. All right. So Cortland, I'll send you lots of reminders. Really, really appreciate this. And we will all be back and I'll be bringing a lot more guests with me next time too. I hope you guys too. And Cortland, have a wonderful few weeks between now and then. Thank I you. Appreciate Love you that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you very right, much. Thank you, Cortland. Thank you. Love you, Cortland. Thank have a good one.